Hello and welcome to the oral session, The Oceans and Their Properties. I'm Georgios Karalabus and together with my co-convener, Peter Nielsen, and on behalf of our international viewers, we'd like to welcome the world experts that will present um, their work today in this session. The ocean is the common denominator of all uh, presentations, but the variety of topics that will be presented today is uh, pre impressive. Equally impressive is the quality of work of uh, the presenters. Um, for example, we will have observations of uh, great way calls, uh, novel methods for acoustic thermometry, smart subsea cables for ocean observation and disaster risk uh, uh, reduction, um, ocean remote sensing uh, at Basin or global scales. Um, and we will have a very interesting investigation of trends of ocean noise during the 2020 COVID lockdown. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, session. Uh, I would like to encourage our viewers to pose questions that we will pass on to the, to the experts. And with that, I would like to welcome the first presenter, Dr. Wenbo Wu from Caltech. And his presentation is titled Seismic Ocean Thermometry Using CTBTO Hydrophone Data. Wenbo, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Wenbo Wu from California Institute of Technology. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, using CTPTO hydrophone to do seismic ocean thermometry. Specifically, we are using hydrophone signals from earthquakes to measure ocean temperature changes. Let's first look at the motivation of this study. Global climate change is one of the major global crises faced by human beings. In the climate system, the ocean plays a key role in regulating how the global warming evolves because it absorbs almost all the excess energy due to intrinsically abundant greenhouse gases, as you can see in the left figure. However, accurate monitoring of ocean warming, especially the deep ocean warming, is still a challenging sampling problem. Currently, the most important data to constrain global ocean temperature change come from Argo. Global Argo Array started in early 2000 and now it's composed of about 4,000 individual floats, as you can see in the right figure. So each dot in, the, in this right figure is one Argo float, and these thousands of floats uh, uh, dramatically improves our capability of monitoring ocean temperature changes. However, even with Argo, some limitations are still present. For example, each Argo float covers a roughly 300 kilometers area, while the massive scale attributes decorrelation scale is about 100 kilometers. So Argo data product could be biased due to the aliasing effects. In addition to that, the current Argo floats 
can only sample the top 2,000 meters ocean and have no data below that. What I'm talking about today is another method called acoustic thermometry method, which can, de which can desirably complement the existing ocean temperature measurements, such as Argo. The principle of acoustic thermometry is quite simple. It takes advantage of high sensitivity of ocean sand speed to temperature. For example, the red figure here shows us the, 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 the relationship between sand speed and ocean temperature. Basically, the, uh, the sand speed travels faster in warmer ocean, and the, its derivative with, with, with respect to temperature is roughly five meter per second per degree. That means one degree temperature increasing would generate uh, sand speed increase of uh, five meter per second per degree. So the idea is inferring ocean temperature changes by analyzing travel time changes of ocean acoustic waves. This kind of acoustic thermometry method has been successfully used to monitor large scale ocean temperature changes. For example, the, this figure here shows the famous ATOC experiment in two decades ago. What they did in ATOC is, is, uh, uh, is putting two repeatable acoustic sources like this in the ocean one near Central California and the other one in Hawaii, and a bunch of hydrophones in North Pacific. By tracking these sand waves travel time changes, the average ocean temperature changes along these thousands of kilometers uh, acoustic wave path are monitored with an accuracy as high as 20 milli degrees. So this active acoustic uh, source experiments are very successful in terms of low cost and high accuracy. However, ATOC raised a huge outcry from public with the concern from, from these sand sources, which may disorient, harm, or even kill marine animals. So far, I would say it's still not conclusive regarding whether or how much these active sources could affect the marine animals, but it did raise the permitting issues for these active source experiments. Inspired by these active acoustic studies, what we do in this project is basically following the same principle, but replacing these man-made repeatable acoustic sources with repeating natural earthquakes. What I'm showing you in this figure is how an earthquake here in the crust can produce acoustic waves ringing in the ocean so far channel. And we call these acoustic waves tertiary wave or shortly T wave. The below figure is a typical seismogram of T wave in the ocean. Because here we, 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 we are using natural sources, it has an even lower cost than active acoustic method and there is no concern of biological impact issue. So next I will talk about how we do seismic ocean thermometry. Before we look at the hydrophone T wave data, here I would like to show some results from this published paper as a background introduction. So the maps here uh, shows us our study region, the Sumatra subduction zone and the Indian Ocean. In this map, the red stars are the repeating earthquakes at the Sumatra subduction zone. Many of these earthquakes are aftershocks of the 2005 uh, uh, magnitude 8.6 big Nias earthquake. This seismometer DGAR is the T wave station or seismometer we used in this study. It's located at this island, Diago Garcia, which is about 3,000 kilometers away from the earthquakes. So what we do is measuring the travel time changes of T waves recorded by DGAR from these repeating earthquakes and inferring the average ocean temperature changes along this 3,000 kilometers T wave path. What I'm showing you in the right figure here is the time series of T wave travel time changes we got from these uh, uh, thousands of earthquakes as well as the predictions by two popularly used oceanography data products, 
the algal climatology in, in orange, orange and echo state, uh, echo state estimates in, in green. Here we have almost a 12 years data from 2005 to 2016. The y-axis on the left here is T-wave travel time changes or travel time anomalies we observed, which can be simply converted to ocean temperature changes or the anomalies and the y-axis on the right here. As you can see, our T-wave uh, results in blue are generally consistent with the echo in green and argo in orange. In addition, our T-wave captures lots of detailed features, such as this peak, this peak, and these peaks, which are missing or underestimated in echo and argo, presumably due to their limited spatial and temporal resolutions. If we do a linear fitting to this 12 years time series, the warming trend from our T wave is about 0 0.044 degree per decade, much higher than the warming rates estimated by ACHO and Argo. So I have demonstrated the result of this T phase station DGAR, and it works quite well. So, why we are interested in hydrophones? Well, a great advantage of hydrophone data is their higher signal to noise ratios. That allows us to use more data from small earthquakes. It's quite nice that we have CTBQ hydrophones H08 here, which is almost co-located with DGAR. That allows us to do a comparison between them. As I show in this cartoon, the hydrophone is intentionally installed in the ocean sofa channel and directly records the sound waves. So it has much better performance of recording high quality T waves than this land-based seismometer DGAR. This is clearly reflected in the right figure here. So here, these two seismograms are from the same earthquake and this date. Its, it's magnitude is quite small, only magnitude 3.6. As you see, the hydrophone records much clearer T waves than the quite noisy orange, or sorry, blue line DJAR data. So the hydrophone really helps us make more small earthquakes like this one usable for, for seismic ocean seismometry. Then what we do is repeating the same thing as we did for DGAR, but now using the hydrophone data. Finally, we get this blue line of hydrophone data time series and we plot this time series together with our previous results from DGAR. As you can see, they are very nicely consistent with each other. You may notice some data gaps in this blue line. For, for example, for this part before 2005, it's due to the combined reasons of the limited number of repeating earthquakes and data gap of the hydrophone. The hydrophone has no data in 2007 and they are apparent timing error, timing errors in 2010 to 2012. So we'll just discard the measurements in this period. Even we have some data gaps in these years for the hydrophone. The total number of measurements from the hydrophone is still much more than that from DGAR. We got about 2,600 earthquakes from HOH but only about 1,000 events from DGAR, just due to the better data quality on the hydrophone. As you can see, we have lots of data coming from the big nearest earthquake in 2005, uh, the, the, the aftershocks of this big nearest earthquake in this black box. So next, uh, let's zoom in this time window to see more detailed features. This is about uh, one year time series. And we can see the clear six month periodicity for example, from here to here, which is expected because our path, T wave path is located near the equator. And you can imagine the sun crosses the equator twice a year. That gives us this half year periodicity. Again, these two lines nicely match with each other. And the hydrophone shows apparently higher data sampling just because more data from small earthquakes. 
Next, we can zoom in this black box to see the features with, a, with an even higher temporary resolution. So here we have about one month time series. Even at this scale, about 10 days time scale, we can still see some variations of the ocean temperature changes. And they are uh, very consistent with each other between hydrophone and DGAR. Here are my conclusions. We confirm that hydrophone can record T wave with higher signal to noise ratios that allows us to use more data from small earthquakes. And the results from DGAR and uh, co-located hydrophone HOH are very consistent with, with each other. In this study, we successfully apply our SOT message uh, uh, to the Eastern Indian Ocean, this region. Since hydrophones have excellent performance of recording T waves, it would be a key component for future global application of SOT. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you very much, Wembo. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, let me ask you if you would like to add something uh, to the presentation. I think, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take right. questions. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we uh, we have uh, we have a question, and uh, I would like to ask the viewers and also the the other participants if they would like to ask something. You can they can unmute themselves and they can ask questions. Uh, Peter would you like to. Uh, yeah. So yeah. there's a question. Yeah. From Alpha. And uh, it goes like this here. What is the link of seismic velocity and the temperature variations? And how do you deal with the local changes in temperature? Or do you simply average the values? Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the great question. For the um, seismic velocity and the temperatures, uh, uh, the relationship, and uh, I thought the question is the, probably is about the uh, velocity in the ocean. So we have seismic velocity in the solid earth and in the ocean. Both of them, they, are, they, they, they depend on the temperature. And for the ocean part, for the ocean part, is, uh, is, uh, we have a quite a good understanding about that. It's uh, because we can measure that in the lab, right? In the laboratory. In the laboratory, you can put the saw, the, the, the saw, uh, put, uh, put, put uh, uh, you know, uh, set up the temperature there and uh, the salinity there, we, we know that, and we just uh, change that. We can measure the sun speed very accurately, so we can get that from the lab. And then we use this relationship to derive the temperature, get the, 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 the sun speed change, and get the, then derive the temperature change. And uh, for for the second question about the local, the local change, and you are right, what we are measuring is the average temperature across the whole section. And, uh, Currently, if we just use one station and we don't know where they are normally uh, normally comes from, we just know the average temperature. But presumably, if you think about, we can if we have a very dense network in the ocean, and that would give us the capability to resolve where anomalies come from. For example, if we have a bunch of hydrophones across the path, and each hydrophone they would record different trial time changes, and then we know where the change, change comes from. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, yes, we can take one more question. Yes. Okay, so there's another question from an, 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 a viewer, Dinan, and uh, he posed the question, could hydro station detect different phases of seismic uh, waves, I believe, and uh, how to calculate the time delay of the seismic sig signal for for the hydrophone station. Yeah, thank you for the question. And the short answer is yes. And not only T waves, we also uh, uh, the hydrophone is also able to detect some other seismic phases which traverse, uh, you know, from the very deep earth. For example, we have the compression of P wave traveling. From the crust, from the mantle, or even from the core, the the, the, the Earth's core, and we also we, we can also detect the S wave. So there are a bunch of other signals 
but the T waves or the acoustic waves traveling in the ocean, they are usually the, the strongest signals and hydrophone. It's due to, you know, what we call the waveguide effects. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's protected these waves from the compli complicated interaction with the bisymmetry. So they are very strong signals. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's my answer. And finally, I would thank the video to uh, for providing such excellent data for us. Otherwise, it would be impossible to do such kind of work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wenbo. Thank you for the compliment and for the for the answers. Uh, so let's move to the next presentation. It's titled "Using Ambient Noise at Hydroacoustic Stations for Passive Ocean Sensing." Uh, the presenter is Dr. Karim Sabra. Karim, the stage is yours. It will be a live presentation. Can you hear me okay now? Now we can. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So my presentation is uh, closely related to what we just heard uh, from the presentation of Wembos. So thank you, Wembos, for the great introduction about uh, acoustic thermometry. I'll come back to that in a second. The, the first thing I would like to uh, to mention is that uh, here I've put a map of, to my knowledge, of the existing hydroacoustic station. And uh, Circle in Red as the one who are uh, currently operated as a uh, uh, station in the SOFAR channel, like indicated uh, below. So this, for scientists, is a great uh, tool. So since we are on the, celebrating the 21st, 25th uh, anniversary of the CTBTO network, one thing I want to mention is that uh, initially it was designed for sure to detect the nuclear monitoring uh, options, explosions. But since then, I was involved with that, uh, with that work since 2011 and 2012. The, the data have been made available to scientists across the world. And uh, I think this is a fantastic use of the IRS hydroacoustic station is that now scientists can use this uh, wonderful network for other applications. And to my knowledge, that's the only global network that for scientists if you're interested in the water acoustics or seismic waves, that's the only uh, um, network where you have hydro access to hydrophone uh, all over the world. So it is a fantastic resource. And also it's not just the hardware existing and then there is the, the scientist team in Vienna, Peter, uh, Georgios, Mario and others, I'm sorry, I'm missing some that we can interact and contact with. So it's, to me, it's also the only existing observatory network where you also have a scientist, dedicated scientist team who's, who's working with the data. And so uh, it's a unique tool and uh, it's, it's great that it's being shared to the scientific co community. So one of the application of this tool uh, besides nuclear explosion is to learn about the ocean. And we all want to know where the, how the ocean is storing heat, how the ocean is evolving. So when both talk, uh, set up the problem very, very nicely. The other thing I want to mention is, as Wenbo said, is each of these hydrophones, we have uh, decades of recording, 10 years, 15 years of recording at certain location. This is unprecedented for acoustic observatory. Hundred, uh, 10 decades of data, high frequency, excellent sampling. Now it can all be done in post-processing and reanalyzing things, so that's fantastic. So here is a picture which was borrowed from an old proceedings put together by Mark Pryor, Georgios, and Dan Brown, and it's just showing the, that uh, seasonal variability of ambient noise. So besides the earthquake event that Wayne Bozo was talking, when there is no earthquake, 99% of the time in between, you just record ambient noise. So the next question comes, can you do something with just the noise, which is you cannot even distinguish clear events. You cannot relocate anything. You have this background noise. So one thing people have studied is that uh, at the CTBTO station in the uh, Ukraine record a wide variety of noise, depending on the frequency band here in the horizontal axis and uh, time here through the years, you have a variability, you have the micro-seism band around 0.1 hertz, then you have a lot of ice noise between 
two and 20, 40 hertz kind of long range propagating noise from the North Pole or South Pole. Also some thin well, well activities. Some of the talk in this session will talk about more about well activities. So I will focus more on this ice noise. One question you can wonder is how can you hear noise from the South Pole or North Pole all the way to the equator where the uh, hydroacoustic station are, are mounted? So one mechanism which explains that is the is the so far channel uh, that uh, Wembos was mentioning. The so far channel correspond here. It's indicated as a slice of the ocean uh, from the North Pole to the South Pole, and uh, the different uh, uh, lines indi indicate the different temperature in the ocean. And so what's interesting because of the combined effect of uh, Temperature reduction going down and pressure increase going up. There is a local minimum of sound speed uh, at most uh, latitudes, and the local minimum sound speed is very shallow at the North Pole or South Pole, uh, and then progressively dive down. So this minimum local of sound speed has a very unique property that sounds kind of get trapped into this uh, local sound speed. So if you see this dashed line here, it's like there is a natural tube in the ocean which trap the sound all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole, and there is energy continuously uh, traveling that tube, as if it was some kind of a hallway with no hard boundary. And so that explains why, if you have some iceberg cracking on the North Pole or the South Pole, this iceberg cracking will couple uh, in the shallow part where the far channel exists and will go down all the way to the equator location where the hydroacoustic station are. And uh, that's why you can record ambient noise from uh, uh, ice origin all the way to the mid-Atlantic. The good thing for us, if we want to crop the ocean, is there is a constant flux of energy traveling the ocean up and down continuously. And if you can harvest this acoustic wave, you can learn about what goes on along. For instance, the simplest way that some technique we, I will present is the idea is that if you have two hydrophone or two array of hydrophone located in the tube, if you do a cross-correlation delay between them, so in that particular application, you don't care what's the origin of the noise. You don't want to characterize a noise source, find a specific earthquake. You just want to listen to the noise of travel between these two sources. And if you do a cross correlation processing, like an interferometry process, you can recover information about just the ocean property between the two hydrophone or the two array. You don't worry about what goes on all before, but you have a very localized, very high sensitive measurement about what goes on between your two hydrophone. So we exploited that technique uh, in this 2015 paper, we look at this effect where we had, for instance, uh, each of the station like Wake Island or Ascension Island, they have a favorable configuration because the South Triad, which is the three element array, the basic one, and the North Triad, there is no land blockage between them. They are separated by about 130 kilometers. And if you do this processing where you steer the North Triad and the South Triad to the north, listening to the North Pole, or in the case here, you steer both triad to the south, listening to the noise coming from Antarctica, you can record waves between each hydrophone of the south triad and each hydrophone of the north triad, and these waves, they correspond to the T wave that Wenbos was talking about. This is wave propagating in the software channel between these two hydrophones across a path of 130 kilometers. So basically, you have a very clear signature of the ocean, just localized in this particular location, and here is kind of a proof principle of uh, doing this kind of noise based uh, thermometry. You could repeat it wherever you had hydrophone into the software channel, but this TBTO station offer a nice demonstration for this particular location. And then the next step is once you understand this wave, you want to understand the physical propagation as how does the sound goes. Another effect is that the amplitude of this wave is seasonally dependent. When there is more ice, breaking, more ice breaking coverage, so if you here, the array is toward Antarctica, it intersects a specific section, for instance, for Ascension Island, you intersect a specific section of the Antarctica coastline. And when the ice uh, margin is forming, when there is the most ice breaking, the most ice dynamic, when the ice is lowest and during the warming, cooling of the ice, that's where you get the highest noise. And when the ice uh, shelf is fully formed, more stable, you get less noise. But so we can clearly establish that noise we listen at Ascension Island is really due to ice quake or ice uh, a tremor activity. So once we have this signal, we can track them through time. So basically what we're going to understand is that in the frequency we use, it's also very low frequency. Another advantage of uh, using uh, earthquake and ice quake is that you can probe frequency range from one hertz to 40 hertz. 
for which there is no magnetic source. The other conventional uh, thermometry sources, they are 200 hertz, 150, 200 hertz and above because of the size requirement. So if you want to probe the ocean over very long distances, using T phases or ice quake noise is much more efficient because you can go so down in range where there is less attenuation. So physically what we have, we basically have around 10 Hertz, so very low frequency, that's the shape of the first mode. And basically what we have, we have this kind of almost very little dispersive wave traveling between the two hydrophones. And because the wave is very dispersive, little dispersion, it makes sense to just study the peak arrival time and track it through time. So the very convincing figure of the proof of concept, which we, we use is that the fact that uh, when we look at the noise coming from Antarctica, which is uh, uh, in red here, or the noise coming from an, uh, from, from the uh, North Pole, we get similar variation. So we make clear like what we measure is really the slice of the ocean between the two hydroxic station, nothing due to anything else. And if we convert the time travel differences into temperature estimate, the other good thing is that the temperature estimate we get from this thermometry method, the error bar is in one order of magnitude smaller than Argo. So it's not that just we get the same trend in the Argo data, which are in gray here, but we also get much higher precision. So for high precision and high dynamic, where here we can get to point every 10 days or less, uh, it's great to use this uh, acoustic wave. But we can do even much better than that if we switch to a, a station within one triad, which are separated only two kilometers apart, we can similarly see variation. In that case here, we have the variation not on the scale of 10 days, but on the scale of one day. So you can even get the tide effect and understanding how the tide effect affect the local water column of the mooring of the hydrophone. So if we pair this correlation processing between two hydrophones only two kilometers apart, you get an arrival, which is around 1.3, which corresponds to a speed of 15 meter per second. And most of the energy, if you do a spectrogram of this arrival, is below 40 hertz. But there is coherent energy all the way. So what is very unique with this method, you get a very broad band source. So if you do some post-processing and whitening of the frequency band, you can basically get an arrival, which is extremely broad band with a high SNR, 100 hertz bandwidth. You cannot get that with a conventional man-made source. And you have a very high SNR. And you can get one measurement every three hours in that case. So with every three hours, you can start to really do local oceanography and understanding tide and other phenomena. And for instance, if you repeat this measurement between station here located in the HO3 station uh, located uh, out of uh, the coast of Chile, if you track this arrival at a very fast scale, you can now see tidal motion. And if you do frequency analysis of this tidal motion, you can see here that you recover the lunar motion, the solar tides, and everything comes up. So you can start to be able to do uh, very localized oceanography. The trade-off is that if you do long range, long integrated scale, you have knowledge of the across the whole basin and you have to reduce your averaging time or reduce your frequency, uh, but you get longer trend effect. If you want to do very local oceanography scale, not the primary mission of the CTBTO, but still of interest for scientists, you can use more localized sensor. And basically you can get a lot of environmental measurement made. But then the final point that I would like to make is that uh, the limit comes that if you want to validate, because at those scale of three meter, five kilometer, very, very local scale, even the Argo float can give you high resolution enough data. So one thought I had maybe looking toward the future of the ocean observatory and what would be the next step is that maybe, and then maybe that's something that Bruce Ho will discuss at the end of the session when he talk about smart cables is that CTBTO had put all the energy, money, and effort to put all this cable. The hardware is there. You have these three cables, you have the cobalt all, all the way to the shore. That's the hardest part. So maybe there is opportunity to add some kind of environmental sensor to the existing hydrophone. For instance, tilt sensor to measure the hydrophone tilt motion, or even along those hydrophone line, if you can put some temperature sensor to mention that, or along the cable, if you can add, maybe I'm dreaming, but maybe adding extra hydrophones or extra environmental sensor, anything. But the fact that we have this cable, we have the power coming in and out, we have the data detection system, that's really a major infrastructure. Is there something else we can do to piggyback ride on the existing infrastructure to make the data set richer and to bring some uh, collaboration uh, with it? Another idea is that whenever there is uh, boats coming back uh, to do maintenance, maybe having some kind of acoustic transmission would be something good, but 
So it's a wonderful network and maybe we can do even more uh, with it. And that's it for my uh, presentation. Thank you. I didn't thank you very much. That was very interesting presentation and, and you, you touched upon a few points that uh, are of high interest to us. And uh, of course, uh, in, in um, future design, hypothetically, you, we can, we could, uh, if we include different sensors, uh, I'm sure the, this metadata will give value to the scientific community but also will help uh, enhance the analysis of, of the data here locally. So, so it's a win-win situation, but it requires, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of engineering and, and, and the revisiting of the stations that have a 20 year design life, no maintenance. So definitely it's something that uh, the next generation of hydroacoustic stations will take into serious consideration and, and your input and other colleagues input into that, it, it will be very, very important. Thank you very much for that. Very, very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from? There's no questions from our. Okay, point. then we'll take them later on. So I think, I think we're ready to, to move to the next presentation, um, which is titled Investigation of Trends in Ocean Noise determined from the CTBTO hydroacoustic stations, including during the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown period. Dr. Stephen Robinson from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK is the presenter. Um, Steve, the stage is yours. from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK. And on behalf of my co-authors, I'd like to present the results of some work to look at the trends in ocean noise in 2020 using the data from the CTPTO hydroacoustic stations. It's well established that the COVID-19 pandemic caused significant reductions in human activity in 2020, and there have been a number of reports of reductions in pollution from human activity, for example, air pollution and urban noise. There have also been reports of local reductions in ocean noise, for example, on the west coast of the USA. Of course, ocean noise is influenced by a number of human activities, including shipping traffic. And there have also been reports of a downturn in shipping traffic during the first half of 2020. For this study, we use the data made available from the CTBTO hydroacoustic monitoring stations which provide recordings of sound pressure up to a frequency of 100 hertz, using triplets of hydrophones placed where possible in the deep sound channel. The study concentrated mostly on three measuring stations, Cape Lewin off Western Australia, Wake Island in the Pacific, and Ascension Island in the South Atlantic, but I'm also going to show provisional results for the analysis of the data from Juan Fernandez in the South Pacific and Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. The basic acoustic metric we're going to show is the sound pressure spectral density level averaged over a one minute interval. So that in one day there are 1,440 data points. And we're gonna aggregate that data over both daily and weekly periods. We will look at the statistical percentiles and for the data shown here, I'll show the 10th percentile. And we're going to look at three frequency bands the 10 to 40 hertz, 40 to 70 hertz, and 70 to 100 hertz bands. This next plot illustrates the difficulties we have in determining whether the data for 2020 is showing a significant change from previous years. The data is for Wake Island from the 40 to 70 hertz band, and we're plotting the daily 10th percentile. So each black dot represents the 10th percentile of the data for that day. Several features are evident in the plot. Perhaps the most clear is the seasonal fluctuation highlighted here by a 30 day moving average plotted in orange through the data. This seasonal fluctuation is driven by several factors. One of them is sea surface temperature, which modulates the amount of sound from surface sources that reach the hydrophones by affecting the propagation of that sound. There's also biological sources such as migrating whale species, and for some of the stations, 
ice is a seasonal factor. Also present are some short term fluctuations in the data and some longer term trends, crudely illustrated here by a straight line fit in red. The straight line fit probably isn't a very good representation of the long term trend. Really, it looks as though the data is reducing in level up to about 2015, leveling off and maybe increasing again after that. So bearing in mind that we have these features, how do we determine if the 2020 data really is showing a reduction? The nature of the data shown on the previous plot makes it difficult for us to do like for like comparisons between equivalent days, weeks or months in adjacent years in order to determine if 2020 shows a reduction. So our approach has been to model the data prior to 2020, forecast the expected noise levels during 2020 using that model, and then compare the forecast with the measured data during 2020. And the model needs to account for the characteristics we've observed in the data and provide uncertainties on the forecast. The particular features of the data and the fact that these are evolving with time somewhat makes it difficult for us to use simple models such as straight line fits, polynomials and Fourier series. The choice of model we've used in this work is called Gaussian process regression or GP for short. This is a flexible way of modeling data that's not limited to functions having particular forms such as polynomials or straight lines. GPs are typically used to model variables that have temporal or spatial dependence and they do it by regarding the values of the variable at different times as being correlated and describing the strength of the correlation as a function of the temporal separation through a covariance kernel. GP regression is a sort of machine learning which can learn the correlation behavior from the measured data collected at known fixed times and then this knowledge can be used for prediction at any time point including those for which a measurement was not made. A particular advantage of the GP regression method is that it provides uncertainties associated with the predictive values. The idea for using this particular type of model came from its use previously in airborne acoustic data and for atmospheric concentration of CO2, which has a not dissimilar characteristic to some of the noise we've shown here. If we undertake this modeling, we get results like the ones shown here. This is a GP regression for a hydrophone at Wake Island. This time it's the 10 to 40 hertz band, and this time it's a weekly aggregation period. And again, we're looking at the statistical percentile of P10. The data for 2020 is not shown. We're only modeling up to the end of 2019. In the plot, the blue dots represent the data the blue line represents the model and the gray band represents the uncertainty of the fit of that model. The next plot shows an expanded view of the data from 2018 onwards, and this time it shows the period of 2020. To the left of the vertical dotted line is the measured data shown in blue points, the fitted model, the blue line and the gray uncertainty bands. To the right of the line is shown the 2020 measured data in red, along with the model values extrapolated forward as a blue line. Note that the forecast model into 2020 is a little smoother than the fitted data because only the long term and seasonal components of the model are used for the forecast, the short term component not being predictable. And notice also that the grey uncertainty bands grow larger as you move forward due to the increased uncertainty when projecting forward in time. You can see that there was a reduction in noise level observed for the first half of 2020. The red points are significantly lower than the model line. The second plot shows the residuals, that is the deviations of the data from the predicted values of the model. To give some scale to these values, the two horizontal dashed lines are drawn at two sigma, where sigma is the standard deviation of the uncorrelated random errors, that is the, the deviations from the model. As can be seen, the red dots in the first half of 2020 show a significant reduction in noise level, 
which appears to recover during the second half of the year. Now that we've seen how the modelling is accomplished, we can look at the results for all three frequency bands for Wake Island and then move on to the other stations. The 10 to 40 hertz reduction we observed earlier is also observed for the 40 to 70 hertz and 70 to 100 hertz band. The red data points in each case falling below the predicted blue line. If we look at the residual plots, we also see the same effect with the red data points representing 2020 falling often outside of the two sigma variations shown in the residual plots. This next plot shows the results for Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. And again, for all three frequency bands, we observe a reduction in the noise levels for the first half of 2020, with that reduction recovering somewhat in the second half of the year. In particular, the results for the 40 to 70 and 70 to 100 hertz bands show a significant reduction. If anything, this reduction is greater than that observed at Wake Island, and the plots of the residuals show this perhaps even better, with often the red data points for 2020 falling well outside of the two sigma values. These next plots show the results for Cape Bluing. In contrast with the results for the previous two stations, it's hard to distinguish here any significant reduction. In fact, the data points shown in red could easily be part of the distribution of values for the data points shown in blue before 2020. The next plots show the provisional results for Juan Fernandez, which is located just off the coast of Chile. Here we again see a noise reduction during 2020, with that noise reduction being maintained for much of the year for the upper two frequency bands. Note that the seasonal variation is different for each of the frequency bands for this station, and the causes of this are currently under investigation and may involve the contributions of biological sources. And now finally, the provisional results for Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. In this case, we see the reduction in level for the first half of 2020 for all three frequency bands, with that reduction appearing to recover by the middle of the year. In summary, then, we've looked at the deep ocean noise data from five CTBDO stations using a Gaussian process regression model to compare forecasts with the actual 2020 measured data including uncertainties. Results of the analysis show significant reductions for four stations, Wake Island and Ascension, and provisionally also Juan Fernandez and Diego Garcia, but no significant change is observed for Cape Lewin. This result accords with the data for global downturns in shipping traffic for the first half of 2020, but we'd also like to compare those reductions with local data for shipping traffic in the ocean basins surrounding the actual hydrophones. This work was funded by the UK Government Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, of which MPL is a part. We're very grateful for the CTPDO allowing us early access to the 2020 data to undertake our research, and also grateful to Georgios, Mario and Peter at the CTPDO for their advice and guidance. And remember that the views in this paper are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent those of the CTPTO. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for this great presentation. Would you like to add something or should we go directly to questions? Uh, no, I'm happy to go to questions if you want. Yeah, um, we have a couple of questions. Peter, would you like to... Uh, the first one. Yes, there's, there's um, a question posted on the super event, and it uh, goes like this here. Is the, are the parameters of the ocean, such as salinity and temperature changes after the COVID-19? Have you, have, you, have you considered those? Have there been any changes in those uh, ocean parameters? And if so, did they influence the noise levels? Could they have influenced the noise levels around the COVID? Yes, potentially they can. Um, but remember, this um, 
model we're using here is an empirical fit. It's not um, a, a noise model which um, has a source propagation and receiver in it. So essentially, we're using um, a, a fitting method that this, this machine learning method doesn't have the mechanism for how the, the sound uh, received by the hadrons is affected by the propagation. It's just um, a fit and a prediction based on the data alone. Um, but talking about, for example, the um, the temperature, um, that perhaps the um, uh, the best sort of uh, examination of that recently, at least for the sea surface temperature, was uh, a paper in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America using not CTBDO data but data from the North Pacific, looking at how surface sources at least are affected by. Uh, propagation effects due to, uh, which vary with sound speed and that it's really rather like the the afternoon effect if you like um, um, however in what we've seen we don't our view is it probably is only part of the answer um, for what what is the season what's causing the seasonal variations and it's possibly part of the long-term variations we see as well is definitely as we heard in the previous two presentations ice which is definitely seasonal which definitely contributes as well and certainly for some of the stations in particular, that low frequency band at Wake Island, there is definitely variations through time of the biological sources. So in that case, what we think are fin whales, they're either getting louder or there are more of them each year, which is causing this seasonal oscillation to change. So um, I hope that explains partly um, of the question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um... Um, I'm sure we will hear more about it in the future. Um, okay, let's to keep to the schedule. Let's uh, let's move to the next uh, uh, presentation by uh, by Dr. Nikita Pinto from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And the presentation is titled "Long-Term Observations of a Potential Great Whale Call from the Central Indian Ocean During 2002 to 2019." Nikita, the stage is yours. A very good day to everyone present. I am Nikita Pinto, a master's student working with Dr. Th Tarun Chandraidula at the Department of Ocean Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. I will be talking about our work that was recently published as a JASA Express letter, in which we presented processing methods used to track the long-term vocal changes from a central Indian Ocean whale species, which to this day remains unidentified. The data used for the study was obtained from the hydroacoustic stations that are part of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization's International Monitoring System. The left-hand side map shows the geographical area of the study. Two hydroacoustic triads used for this work are shown in red dots. One is to the north and the other is to the south of the island Diego Garcia. These triads have been maintained by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization since 2002. For this work, we used 18 years of hydroacoustic observations recorded on a single hydrophone at each one of these stations. The hydrophone's flat band response is from a few hertz up to 105 hertz. On the right-hand side is a spectrogram, which provides a visual representation of the unidentified Diego Garcia call. The spectrogram has time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and the color map determines the intensity of the recorded signal. This particular spectrogram is obtained by averaging spectrograms from 50 calls recorded over 2002 at both the north and the south hydrophones. The figure shows that the Diego Garcia call comprises a comb of tones between uh, 35 to 45 hertz. And this is followed by a downsweep that goes from 35 to 33 hertz. The comb and downsweep together last about 10 to 15 seconds. They are followed by narrowband component at 20 hertz. Our work, however, focused on the comb and the downsweep frequencies. The frequencies of the Diego Garcia call change over an 18-year period, as shown in the following slide. These plots are spectral averages from the north and south hydrophones. These were generated by averaging one-minute spectra for each day over the 18 years. Data for the north, however, ended at 2013. The plot shows that the frequencies of the Diego Garcia call, which are shown in the black boxes, seem to both increase as well as decrease over the 18 years. This peculiar nature of the change, as well as the presence of interference, make it challenging to quantify these frequency changes. Over the next few slides, we will take a detailed look at the changing frequencies, 
go into the processing methods used to track the changes and also discuss the possible reasons behind them. The Diego Garcia hydrophones regularly record calls from the unidentified whales and from another species, the Omura whales. The Omura whale calls have a bandwidth of 17 to 50 hertz and last about 10 to 12 seconds. The time frequency characteristics overlap with those of the Diego Garcia call, and we therefore need detectors that are able to distinguish between these two types of calls. We built the detectors in the following way. For each year, we picked 50 calls spread out over the year from both stations. We then averaged the spectrograms of these calls to get a yearly average spectrogram. The regions in the spectrogram that went above a particular threshold, in our case, 100 dB for the Diego Garcia call and 90 dB for the Omura call, were used to estimate the major frequencies of the whale calls. We modeled the calls as a matrix of sinusoidal tones that represent the major frequencies of the comb and a linear frequency modulation that represents the downsweep. This matrix is referred to as the whale call subspace. The methodology gives us one detector for the Diego Garcia call and another for the Omura whale call for each year. In order to detect the whale calls in the acoustic observations X, we use a matte subspace approach that assumes a linear signal plus noise model for the observed data. The whale call is represented by the subspace denoted H. The amplitudes and phases of the sinusoids contained in H are unknown and represented by the vector theta. The optimum detector for this linear signal plus noise model, which minimizes the probability of error, is a matte subspace detector. The detector computes a constant false alarm rate statistic T of X using a projection matrix PH. T of X is compared against the threshold, and when it exceeds this threshold, the detector decides that a call is present. The test statistic effectively measures the ratio of energy of the observation vector X in the whale call subspace against the energy in an orthogonal noise subspace. The ratio follows an F distribution whose parameters are given by the subspace dimension. For our purposes, we set a 1% false alarm threshold for the detectors. As part of the processing methodology, we also rejected high intensity interference from nearby shipping, natural events, and electronic noise by computing mean power across a 15 to 16 hertz frequency band in five minute segments. If the mean power crossed a 90 dB per hertz threshold, we excluded the segment from processing. Lower intensity sounds generated by shipping and air gunning activity, which last long intervals ranging from 20 minutes to six hours, were identified by comparing the ratio of the average power in a 30 to 45 hertz band across short time segments, 15 seconds, to preceding longer time segments, 30 seconds. This ratio was calculated at a one second resolution average over five minute segments, and then tested against a threshold of 1.15. Segments that crossed the threshold were then included in the processing. Finally, to distinguish between the Omura and Diego Garcia calls, we ran both calls as subspace detectors in parallel and compared the outputs to make a final decision in case of any clashes. This slide shows the results of running the interference detectors and the subspace detectors over the 18-year data set. Each plot shows the daily number of calls for each year between 2002 up to 2019. The gray bars correspond to detections at the north and the black to detections at the south. The north hydrophones record the whales between November to February and in some years between May to June. The south records them from June to November. Now moving on to how we use the detector outputs to track the changing call frequencies. For each year with more than 50 detected calls, we computed the call periodograms in a 30 second window around the call detection times, and then averaged them over a day to obtain a daily average call periodogram shown by the blue line in this figure. We then considered one Hertz frequency bands and computed the centroids or frequency weighted average for each of these bands. The centroids are shown by the red dots. For our application, we then focused on those centroids which exceeded an 85 dB per hertz threshold. These are circled in black. We uh, averaged the values that tend to cluster and finally obtained the estimates of the Diego Garcia call frequencies for a given day. We applied this processing methodology to the 18-year data set to finally obtain the following long-term frequency tracks. 
In this figure, we see an overlay of the centroids estimated at the north and south atop their respective spectrograms. The spectrograms seem to trace straight lines, most of which have a positive slope going upwards, and another one going downwards, shown in white. The frequencies which correspond to the tones of the comb increase up to a maximum frequency between 40 to 43 hertz and then disappear. The years following 2013 seem to have more lower frequencies than the earlier years. The comb part of the call has apparently shifted down while giving rise to separate tracks of increasing frequencies. One of the tracks that begins at 35 hertz and consistently decreases in frequency corresponds to a downsweep. The downsweep seems to give rise to new branches in 2005, 10, 14, and 17 that all move up in frequency over time and appear parallel to each other with approximately the same slopes. Details of the frequency changes, which were not visible in the raw spectrograms, were picked up using the processing methodology presented in this talk. The left-hand side figure plots the north and south centroids together to track the dominant frequencies and fit straight lines across them using linear regression. The right-hand side shows the residuals of this linear regression. The tracks which increase show changes that range from less than one hertz going up to five hertz, the most prominent, which starts at 34 and ends at around 40 in a span of 13 years. The plots that seem to start later on in the observation period correspond to frequency tracks that branched off and then continue to increase. The track which follows the downsweep remains consistent over the 18-year period and goes from 35 hertz down to 28 hertz. We could not fit any seasonal trends to the residuals because of the poor temporal resolution of the call seasons that rendered the problem ill-conditioned. Blue whale call frequencies are decreasing for other whale species in the Indian and Southern Ocean, as seen in fin whale, Sri Lankan, Australian, and Madagascan pygmy blue whales, and the Antarctic blue whales, as seen in the figure taken from Leroy et al. 2018. The frequency of the Diego Garcia calls downsweep does decrease in keeping with the changes observed in other whales, but the calls show additional changes, such as the increase in the comb frequencies, disappearance of some frequencies, and the appearance of new ones. These peculiar observations give rise to a question about the potential causes for these call frequency changes. Prior acoustic studies have shown that cetaceans modulate their call frequencies in response to increases in background noise. To investigate a relationship between the frequency changes and ambient noise levels, we observe daily average noise levels across a 15 to 60 hertz frequency band for the years 2002 up to 2019. The noise levels at Diego Garcia do not show a uniform trend across the years, but rather increase up till 2010 and then decrease, followed by a sudden increase around 2015. The frequency tracks for the unidentified whale, on the other hand, showed a uniform increase or decrease across the years. During periods of high noise, during shorter time periods of high noise levels, observations showed no corresponding change in frequencies. A second type of analysis compared the estimated call frequencies with the annual noise levels across frequency to check if the whales are shifting their frequencies out of their 30 to 45 hertz frequency band into neighboring quieter bands. The figure shows the annual one minute spectral averages between 15 to 60 hertz for each year between 2002 to 2019 for the North Station in black and the South Station in gray. The noise estimates were greater the lower frequencies between, 30 to, between 15 to 30 hertz, especially at the South Stations. The levels, the noise levels seem to decrease uh, beyond 45 hertz consistently across all years at both stations. The decrease on the downsweep frequency, therefore, may not be in response to ambient noise levels, which are higher at the lower frequencies. And although the noise levels do decrease for the higher frequency bands, the whales increase their frequencies only to fade out before actually reaching these higher, quieter bands. Noise thus seems to not be the reason for the change in the call frequencies. Other reasons suggested to explain the frequency changes include genetic changes and increases in whale population sizes in a post-whaling era. 
we rule out genetic changes as a driver because the 18-year observation period considered in this paper is too short in comparison to evolutionary time scales. And while the increase in population sizes might explain the decrease in the downstream frequency, it does not account for the increase in the rest of the Diego Garcia call frequencies. In light of these hypotheses and none of them explaining all the observations, we finally suggest two more drivers that could be at work. The first is that the increase and the decrease could be due to two different pressures. The second is that the whales in modulating their downstream to lower frequencies involuntarily cause the other frequencies to shift higher or vice versa. Of course, testing these different hypotheses would require identifying the whale and studying the animal in the field. We are also interested in the existence of a link between the changing call frequencies and the migration parts of these animals. As part of this investigation, we are working on providing location estimates for these whales using wideband beamforming methods and a realistic N cross 2D parabolic equation propagation model. We are grateful for the data access provided by the CTBTO and for the financial assistance from the Naval Research Board India. Thank you for listening. I will be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikita. That was very, very interesting. Um, I think we should move to the next one just to stay on schedule, and then afterwards we can uh, have um, any questions. Um, so we move to the next speaker. Uh, Professor Bruce Howe um, will present smart subsea cables for observing the ocean and Earth and update. Bruce, the floor is yours. Aloha. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today about smart cables here at the CTBTO Science and Technology 2021 venue with a community that understands the value of a permanent, robust, and reliable observing system. SMART stands for Science Monitoring and Reliable Telecommunications. The vision of the Joint Task Force for Smart Subsea Cables is to observe the oceans and Earth with a planetary scale network of sensor-enabled submarine telecommunications cables delivering tangible societal benefits. The Joint Task Force, or JTF, is sponsored by three UN agencies, the International Telecommunications Union, the World Meteorological Organization, and the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. About 190 JTF members from over 30 countries, representing 110 organizations, are volunteering their time and expertise to bring the smart cable concept to fruition. The JTF mission is to implement telecom plus sensing smart subsea cable systems on a global scale to support climate, ocean circulation, sea level rise, and tsunami and earthquake early warning and disaster risk reduction. This will be a first order addition to the ocean and earth observing system. We will share the summary network that links countries and continents together, enabling our society and civilization. We will leverage this amazing living real-time network, a $5 billion per year industry, 1 million plus kilometers of cable, 20,000 repeaters every 70 kilometers or so, that can ultimately host sensors, constantly being replenished with an engineering life of 25 years. Telecom is the primary mission with smart secondary. The smart portion of the system shall have no negative impact on the telecom portion. The basic sensors are ocean bottom temperature, pressure, and seismic acceleration. By better knowing the cable environment, we can better assure cable integrity. The orange circles represent first systems. The green circle represents the CAM system underway in Portugal's Atlantic domain with smart capability. A number of other systems are in various stages of planning and requests for proposals. The Smart Cables program is gaining momentum and seeks support from all stakeholders to bring the concept to fruition. The program is audacious, innovative, and transformative, a perfect example of the blue economy within the context of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It can contribute to and complement the hydroacoustics and seismic components of the CTBTO 
international monitoring system. Why are we doing this, creating a smart network? The major reason is because humanity's greatest existential threat is climate change, and smart cables can contribute. With smart, real-time observations, we will contribute to the sustainable development goals of the UN 2030 agenda and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And these SDGs are integral to the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. We will continue to, we will contribute to the knowledge of climate change, including ocean circulation, heat content, and regionally, regionally variable sea level rise as well as mitigating the threats of tsunamis and earthquakes. At the same time, improving societal connectivity, the primary mission of the cables, through improved cable integrity with awareness of their environment and network resilience using knowledge of the environment from smart cables to better plan future cable routes. This cartoon shows some of the components of the ocean and earth observing system. Satellites are crucial and with complete global surface coverage. Smart cables will complement and augment other in situ elements such as Argo floats and DART tsunami warning buoys, providing for the first time comprehensive deep ocean sustained observation. What do the three simple sensors, ocean bottom temperature, pressure, and seismic acceleration tell us? Deep ocean temperature is increasing 50 milli-degrees C per decade. That's the red color here. Ocean bottom temperature will contribute to better estimates of heat content and thermal expansion of seawater leading to sea level rise, which is regionally variable. It affects ocean circulation on all scales and depths, and thus climate. Sea level is rising at five millimeters per year presently and projected to be eight millimeters per year by the end of the century. There are extremely few time series of bottom pressure and more, none are long-term. Measuring the increase in ocean mass due to land meltwater will contribute to sea level rise estimates. Differential pressure across the basins and varying bathymetry will constrain ocean circulation. Ocean bottom pressure and seismic acceleration will significantly improve earthquake and tsunami early warning. Red symbols on the map are earthquakes here. Initial tsunami warnings based on seismic data have large uncertainty. In situ pressure measurements are needed for reliable tsunami height predictions. This new seismic array will fill the large ocean area observing gaps, enabling a vast improvement of our understanding of Earth's interior. These first three simple, robust, and precise sensors and observations will provide a wealth of new and unique insights and pave the way for more. The fundamental technical goal of the SMART initiative is to make the SMART repeater a ubiquitous off-the-shelf component of the submarine cable industry, routinely available to incorporate into any new system and ideally, ideally most systems for a modest estimated 10% incremental cost. There are engineering issues to address, all solvable. The first systems will result in a repeater that is warranted for 25 year life. Smart cables as part of the global ocean observing system will provide benefits for society, science, our stewardship of the environment and the cable network itself. Smart cables is a perfect example of the blue economy with mutual benefit to all stakeholders. A modest investment will leverage the resources and expertise of the $5 billion per year telecom cable industry represented here in the pictures. Suppliers are publicly acknowledging the great importance of climate change and their intent to include it in their corporate strategy, including supplying smart capability. With the Portuguese CAM system demonstrating demand, the equation is balanced. Smart and other sensors will improve cable integrity and therefore their primary mission of societal connectivity. Smart data will improve cable routing and thus network resilience. 
JTF Smart Cables will continue its role of facilitation and coordination via a program office. Via avenues within ITU, WMO, and IOC, the JTF will encourage adoption and implementation. Research and education networks, such as JEON, are stepping up to help. We are working to involve development and investment banks and philanthropies. We continue to pursue opportunities now with regional systems with significant government involvement and funding. As noted, we need to be involved in projects early in the planning pro process. We have learned we need to keep it simple, KISS. This means both technically and politically. We work with and involve all stakeholders to advance the SMART concept to fruition. The CAM2 system in Portugal is a perfect example of a SMART system at this point in, in the SMART development cycle. CAM2, replacing an older system, will link the continent to the Azores, Madeira Island, and back to the continent in a ring. And it will be explicitly SMART with other sensing as well. A prime motivator is the very destructive 1755 earthquake and tsunami. The government will be bearing the cost, no citizen left behind for territorial cohesion. The LEA group is providing science advice to the implementing entity, IP Telecom. Smart Cables is following an innovative path outside the classical oceanography box. As well proven, transformative technology transforms science, in this case enabling unique ocean observations of major importance with societal benefits. It will extend infrastructure into the ocean, power and communications, and unlock the global deep ocean. Think more observations of different types and other elements using the power and real-time communication. With respect to the CTBTO, smart cables will provide a dense global coverage for ocean and climate, earthquakes and tsunamis. With planned and future sensors that will improve IMS performance, both hydroacoustic seismic with improved estimates of the propagation media. The technologies related, we can learn and benefit from each other. Smart cables will contribute to and complement the CTPTO mission and vice versa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce, for this very interesting um, presentation. And again, you paved the way for future plans and thinking here for the next generation of hydroacoustic stations. Uh, so let's open the floor for questions to Bruce and then for all the the participants of the session. Do we have any questions for Bruce? We don't have any questions for Bruce, do we? Okay. Let me Could I make now. a comment or two? Could I make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thinking back to uh, Kareem and, and uh, when Jews, uh presentations on, on uh, seismic uh, tomography and, and then also uh, the, the passive tomography that, that was discussed. Um, right now in, in the smart cable world, we're considering um, also cables uh, in New Zealand and also to Antarctica. In fact, in a few hours, I get back onto a workshop for the latter. In both cases, we're considering hydrophones to be essential elements of of the of those cable systems and so they would they would fit in perfectly into those passive acoustic uh, methods as as well as using active sources and i'm thinking is specifically it's for instance with the antarctic situation if we're measuring the acoustic local signature of ice generated noise then that will better inform these passive methods um, and enable uh, essentially uh, the differential kind of tomography along the north-south cable to New Zealand, for instance, but then also absolutely to Cape Lewin and, and Wake Island and, and other stations. So by measuring the, the, the localized ice uh, sort of acoustic transfer function, uh, as a source, um, just like repeater earthquakes, if you will, um, that'll enable 
uh, much larger uh, ocean temperature measurements. Thank you. Um, okay. We have ten minutes. Yeah, we have one question, I think, for Nikita. Nikita. Yeah. Okay, so Peter, would you like to? Hi, Nikita. I have a question for you both. Yeah. Posted, uh, and, and it goes like this here. Humpback whale songs are known to trend culturally across the population. Have you considered the hypothesis that the observed call frequency changes are similarly culturally determined? Well, uh, first of all, like I mentioned, uh, these whales that uh, I was talking about are yet to be seen. They're yet to be visually spotted. So uh, we're not sure how many groups or how many populations of these whales that produce similar kinds of sounds are around in the Central Indian Ocean. So until we know that information, we cannot say whether it's different social groups uh, coming in contact and exchanging song uh, patterns and frequencies, or whether it's evolution or sorry uh, vocal evolution within one particular group of whales okay so so let me just add during that time span you've been looking at you you, you cannot say that it's necessarily the same species or this the same individuals and uh, like i, I have a, like right. I have a certain frequencies in what, when i'm speaking you know georges has other frequencies so if you were swimming passing 808, it'll pick up different sound. Right, so uh, I do believe that they're the same species of whale and that's because we have 18 years of recordings that show these whales in certain areas at the same time every year. They have a very seasonal presence and their call structure is very similar except the fact that they're changing frequencies. But I don't know what are the exact number of calling individuals within those, uh, within uh, the calls that we pick up because for now without having seen them we have no way of saying how many whales are producing these number of calls okay thank you all right thank you very much and i believe that nikita has a question for steve um for its hydroacoustic station um did you average the noise level for all three hydrophones this is a question. That's, that's a good question. Um, in our past work, we did, we did a paper a couple of years ago looking with, with a slightly different method of looking at the trends, and we did exactly that. We took all three hydrophones of the triplet and averaged them all. Um, first of all, we made sure that they looked uh, they were giving equivalent results. In this case, we've not done that, so the results I showed are for one of the hydrophones only. Um, however, when we examined all three hydrophones, we saw essentially the same behavior. So it's fairly representative of all three. So in this case, I showed data for one hydrophone only, um, but um, the hydrophones seem to look very similar in, in, in the trends they show. Um, and I only show the north of Wake Island, but the south looks very similar as well. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question for Bruce. Uh, this 10% incremental cost of smart cables. How how does it get absorbed? I mean, uh, now we are at the beginning, and how do you see that being absorbed in 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 the future, especially when you have you know private sector, public sector, you know. Don't, how, how does how does this work? <laughs> well, that's a very good question, and and we're we're searching for a, a long term answer to that. Presently. Um, our, our approach is basically to uh, work with with countries and governments that want the system, and so it's basically up to the government to find the funding. So Portugal has found, you know, they are including the cost of the, the smart increment into the total package, and and I mean they they apparently will use five G uh, spectrum auction. Uh, proceeds to pay for the submarine cable. Uh, the the New Zealand government, that's been Ministry of Business, is promoting that for uh, again connectivity purposes, and the expectation is is the basic smart component would again be absorbed into the overall project. The third one, the NSF National Science Foundation, 
proposed project to Antarctica obviously would be, you know, government funded in science. So at the beginning, um, it'll be situations like that. And, and then uh, as, as hopefully we transition to more commercial uh, involvement, then uh, as the financing for a cable system is, is arranged, which is often a very convoluted process, the expectation is, is that the relevant government agencies in the countries involved will step forward with the funding, but that has yet to be demonstrated. So it's, right. it's, it's a very good question. And that's, that's the main question people ask, ask. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So do we have any other questions from our viewers? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, great question for Nikita. Hi, Nikita. Mario here. Uh, one, one last question. Um, re regarding the way calls into reports, uh, what's the relation between those and the ones that have been reported recently on using data from Diego Garcia that were reported by groups in Australia, for example, Tracy Rogers and colleagues? Uh, how, how they do they resemble each other? Um, you're muted, Nikita. Are you talking about the paper? Uh, the main author was uh, Leroy, Emmanuel Leroy. Is yeah. that the same paper? Yes, affirmative. Uh, yes, so those are the same whale calls that they are talking about. And I believe they have also picked up these whale calls on two other stations um, in the Indian Ocean. One is off the coast of Western Australia, and the other, I'm not sure, it's somewhere midway between uh, Sri Lanka and Australia. So these are the same calls that they've reported on. Uh, where they looked at, they tried to look at the seasonal geographical uh, distribution of uh, the same unidentified whales. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, so that concludes our session. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, would like to thank all our uh, presenters. Excellent, excellent work, excellent presentation. We'd like to thank all our viewers. And um, I hope to see you all in person soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing. Thank you.